Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we're thrilled, uh, we're thrilled to have uh, uh, Esther Hargitay here from Northwestern. Uh, she's also at the Berkman Center, and uh, she's been visiting on and off for the past few months, and we would love for her to continue to do that. More on than off, actually, <laughs> is what we'd love. So uh, she's going to be talking about skill matters, how web savvy and other factors influence online behavior. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm actually really curious to know who's here. So I know there are some people from MSR, obviously, um, but there are some people who are not affiliated with MSR. So some people from IBM Research, yes. <laughs> um, anybody else willing to say where they're from? Harvard Ed School. Harvard Ed School. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. So. <coughs> I, start, I thought I'd start with a slide about where I'm coming from in all this, because uh, most speakers we hear from in the speaker series are more toward that end of the spectrum, and I wanted to be open about where I am on the spectrum. Um, so my training is in sociology, and um, as you can see, that's not the most pure form of science, as <laughs> according to this cartoon at least. Jeff, is there a way to turn this down, or is this necessary? I feel like it's super loud. OK, well. Um, anyway, so that's just to give you some idea of uh, my training and where I'm coming from in all this. And that a lot of the questions that we deal with in the social sciences are very, um, they're not as neat as certain uh, mathematical models sometimes allow for in other sciences. OK. so. Uh, I thought I'd start with the large questions that guide my work, and I'm generally going to give you a pretty large framework uh, for my work, and then I'll, I'll dig deeper at the end with a specific study that I've been conducting. But since a lot of the work that you guys do isn't really related to this area, I thought I'd give you a larger context than I usually do. So partly, um, or in large part, what I'm interested in is what people do online and how that differs. Um, across different people, and in particular, whether differences that we might observe in people's online behavior is random or whether it's systematically related to uh, user attributes, user background, and other social factors especially. Um, and then, ultimately, what are the potential implications, especially social implications, social, cultural, political, economic implications of such differential online behavior. But I thought I'd start with why we should care about this. Um, OK, so there's a lot of enthusiasm about how recent web developments are, uh, uh, have all sorts of potential for various realms of life. And there's this general idea that various online developments are going to improve people's life chances in all sorts of realms. Um, and in addition to this, the last point is more a methodological one, which I think is especially related to work people do, several people do here, uh, which is that new web developments will help us understand social behavior better because they allow us to see what people are doing. Um, and I'm going to speak to that specifically a little bit as well. So in terms of the large question, what I'm interested in as a sociologist and a sociologist who's especially interested in social inequality is who are the people who, are gonna, who have the most potential to benefit from time spent online from their um, uh, web uses. And so there are different scenarios that we could imagine uh, if, if we look at data over time. Um, so one possibility is that we have people in lower socioeconomic status and we have people in higher socioeconomic status and they spend time online. And let's say that because the web has so much to offer, everybody improves their life chances to some extent, but it happens pretty much to the same extent. So overall, in the end, everyone's kind of in the same position relative to others. So that's one possible outcome. There are other outcomes. Um, one possible outcome is that those who are at a lower uh, socioeconomic status actually uh, gain more from being able to use the web in various ways and thus are able to 
at a societal level, thus we can see a decrease in differences among those who are uh, less privileged and those who are more privileged. However, there's also a third possibility, which is that, in fact, uh, we see an increase in uh, inequality due to the web, which is that those who are already in more privileged positions are actually better able to benefit from all that the web has to offer, and thus they take off and uh, improve their life chances and situation in society even more uh, than those who are at lower SES. Uh, of course, you could actually even imagine other scenarios, which is that they actually go this way. Um, but I'm going to assume that uh, there are benefits to, to the web and uh, everybody could improve their life chances. It's not like I'm actually going to model this, so it doesn't really matter. It's sort of a theoretical idea. Um, <laughs> A part of the reason for that is that we don't really have longitudinal data to allow us to look at this. So, um, and as I keep on talking, I'll, I'll tell you about why we have challenges with that. So I'll, uh, one of the things I, I talk about is the challenges of data to address these questions. Okay, so I just thought I'd give one example, which is actually quite timely. Um, today, the Pew Internet and American Life Project came out with a report about identity management online, reputation management online, and how much people are doing it. And, those of you who follow related issues may know that Facebook's in the news a lot these days about their privacy settings and privacy issues there. So does any of that matter? Well, Microsoft actually commissioned a report last year that showed <coughs> that employers, this is just one real life example of why this might matter, that employers actually do look at what information is available about potential employees. And so in fact, what you do online and what, is, what information is available about you online may actually influence uh, what jobs you get, which then of course could influence lots of other outcomes in your life. And so this is just one snippet, just one example of why what you do online and how you present it yourself online might have real world outcomes. Okay, so um, what I'll do now is give you the framework for the specific work that I do with respect to online behavior. So there's a whole tradition of uh, literature that looks at who is online and who isn't. That's called the basic digital divide. There are still about 25% of Americans actually who are not online at all. Um, now those are not really the people I look at. So I start out with the user. So this image stands for the user. So I study users. And one of the things I do is I'm very conscious about recognizing that that person, so people are in a certain socioeconomic status. Um, a lot of work actually tends to ignore this completely and argue that we can't ignore that, it actually matters. Uh, but what I also argue is that additionally, other factors matter too. So your technical context of use will matter as will your social context of use. So technical context of use refers to things like the quality of equipment you use, your network connection, things like that. Um, Social context of use refers to things like the number of people in your network who use the internet and how knowledgeable they are about the internet. So if you run into a problem, can you turn to someone for help? Things like that. Five brothers and sisters sleeping in the same room, does it count into the context or not? It could absolutely count, yeah, definitely. Any of those, I mean, this is very broad. Lots of things could matter. It's an empirical question as to what of it exactly matters. Yeah, so age, um, I, it's kind of grouped, uh, it's not socioeconomic status, but it's, this is demographics on socioeconomic status. So age, gender, race, ethnicity, SES are all here. So yeah, those definitely matter. Those are kind of the usual suspects, so I didn't mention them explicitly, but yes, definitely. Definitely, the assumption is that that matters, and in fact, we know from work that age and education tend to be the most salient predictors of internet use at all, and then other things too, I'll come back to that. Now something that um, is fairly uh, unique in my work in this question is a look at skill and internet skill. And that's something I've argued for this point a decade, which makes me feel very old. But um, so I've, I've done work for about a decade looking at how internet skill matters in how people use the internet and that we need to collect data on that. And so that's partly what I'll be talking about today. And um, I guess I don't have a separate slide on skill. I could give a whole talk on what I mean by skill. I mean all sorts of things. I mean it very broadly defined. Anything from awareness about various services that exist to the ability to use them, to use them efficiently, 
all the way to being able to evaluate content one encounters online, evaluate the credibility of material one finds. So skill I consider very broadly um, in, ver in many ways. Now as to how we measure it, that's a whole other topic. And I mean, that I'll talk about briefly, uh, but that's a big challenge of this area. And so ultimately what I argue is that, or the question is that all these things will influence how people actually use uh, the internet or digital media more broadly. And then the really big question is how skill and types of uses feed back into people's socioeconomic status, life chances, well-being in the workplace productivity or in school academic achievement. So that's the ultimate big question. And again, for that, we'd need longitudinal data, which we don't really have. So that's still more of a question for the future. OK, so we have amazing amounts of data on internet uses, right? I mean, we collect logs. Lots of sites collect logs. Tons of material out there. Yippee yay. So why am I saying that we lack the data to answer some of the questions that I'm raising? Well. The reality is that while we have tons of data about internet uses, we actually don't have that much data on average internet users per se. And the reason is that um, you can't just rely on log data, which I'll get into in the next slide. But basically, data sets that we have based on, say, survey research uh, that asks people about their internet uses to self-report uh, are rarely comparable across surveys. Uh, we lack established terms in terms of how to ask about things. And of course, we're studying a moving target. So especially for longitudinal work, no one, you couldn't have asked about Twitter use five years ago, right? That didn't exist. So you could have maybe asked four years ago, but you could have asked about 100 different sites as well. And who, the, who knew that Twitter was going to be the one that you should be asking about because it would be relevant five years, four years later. So that's one of the reasons it's really tricky to ask surveys over time that have questions that are actually relevant over time. On the other hand, in order to have survey responses be comparable over time, you need to ask the same questions. So this is a big challenge of this area. So I wanted to say a few words explicitly about the limitations of log data, because I know a lot of people in this room use log data. And they're obviously a great source of all sorts of information, but they do have some limitations. And the, this is just to partly explain why I use the methods that I do use and partly to signal to those of you who use log data what you should keep in mind as you use such data. So one of the issues is that becoming a user of a service, so often we have log data through like Google or Facebook or one site has data on you, right, on its users. But the fact is that becoming a user of a service is not a random event. Um, work has shown this. We can show this. Uh, but it's not that shocking, I think, to imagine that service is diffused to, in different populations. And so if, uh, I mean, both Dana and I have shown in work, for example, that uh, users of Facebook and MySpace differ by race ethnicity. So again, not a random event that you became a user of Facebook initially or even today. That means if you're using Facebook data to make conclusions about various social phenomena, you have to recognize that you're sampling out, you're selecting out or uh, certain populations so that whatever conclusions you're drawing can only be generalized to certain populations. So that's one issue. Another is that people understand and use sites and services very differently. And so if you're only looking at log data, you don't really know what those differences are per se. So for example, some people might live their entire social lives on Facebook, whereas others might have an account, but use it very rarely, whereas others might have an account, use it often, but only for work contexts, et cetera. And if you don't really know what they're using it for, some of that you might be able to get from the logs, but it's not really clear that you can. So again, if you don't have the context for the data, you might be comparing apples and oranges, even if you're comparing data from the same site. And a third point is that what people do on one site is usually just one aspect of behavior that they engage in using all sorts of media, not just sites, but media, right? So some of my best friends I simply do not communicate with on Facebook. So you might have my log data from Facebook, and you might think you know about my friends and friendships. But in fact, you don't know about my best friends because we don't use Facebook to communicate. And when you generalize this to millions of users, who knows what information you're finding when you are uh, using log data from Facebook. So those are just a few things to keep in mind when using log data. OK. So I thought I'd uh, say a few words about uh, data I've collected in the past that has informed work that I do today. So a lot of um, some of the work I did earlier on, for example, my dissertation uh, in New Jersey, uh, was based on, bless you, um, 
in person observations and interviews uh, with people who I'd come have come into the lab and asked them to look for different types of content, recorded what they did, and basically came up with scale measures in terms of whether they were able to find information and how Im efficient they were at it. And unlike some of the research in information science that does this, where they ask for tend to ask for uh, sort of trivia questions, uh, factoids, I came up with questions that were mo more relevant to people's everyday lives. So questions uh, about health matters or politi political engagement, things like that. Um, the, the upside is that it's more relevant to people's lives. The downside is that it's harder to compare across ca cases because it's not like, oh yeah, you got it absolutely right. This is the one correct answer. But from all these observations, and then since then, over the years, we've done more and more observations like this in the lab. So what I did already in the initial work was I took the uh, measures from actual observations and created survey measures or figured out what survey measures corresponded well to the uh, measures through actual observations. So one of the challenges of survey data is, of course, that it's self-reported information, right? And there's a whole entire field that looks at how things get underreported, overreported, people satisfy, et cetera. Um, so what I tried to do, mine was one of very few studies, uh, in fact, it's really the only one I can think of, that uh, looked at, had data on actual skill, but then also had survey data, and I was able to see which survey data correlated well enough with the actual skills to then figure out what survey, what survey questions I could use on f future instruments. And the point of this is that, of course, meeting with people one-on-one -on -one in the lab is incredibly labor-intensive and time-intensive and expensive, um, so it's very hard to get large enough samples where you can start running statistical analyses where you can generalize to larger populations. Whereas if we have survey instruments, then we can get large enough and that we can have a representative population and start to look at um, larger trends. So it's basically the survey instruments derived from these studies, for that, from that initial study that I use later for the skill measure. Okay, so to answer some of the questions I'm interested in about whether skill varies, what predicts skill, how skill relates to online behavior, I need, sur I need larger scale data um, on a population, that a sample large enough uh, for some statistical analyses. Now, in an ideal world, I'd have data for nationally representative uh, group, but unfortunately, I've never really had that kind of funding, so uh, what I've done uh, has been to focus on a very specific population that is, however, very diverse. So I've been doing studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. So I'll give you a little bit of geography as to what's going on here. So UIC is where I've done the studies, and you might be wondering why, since we said that I'm at Northwestern, and wouldn't it be more convenient for me to study Northwestern students? Well, but we also said that I'm interested in questions of social inequality, and Northwestern is a fairly elite institution, so we don't quite have the diversity in students that would be helpful for the kinds of questions I'm interested in. Now, before you think that it's just a question of convenience that I was um, doing my study at UIC, I thought I'd show you a map of Chicago. For those of you not really familiar with that region, um, here's an, so there's Northwestern up in Evanston, and UIC is down smack middle of Chicago. Um, so a local map looks like this. So in fact, um, <laughs> Evanston and UIC are about as far as Reading and Cambridge. So it's not quite just drop, you know, running over to the neighborhood. Um, it's about 15 miles. Moreover, um, we did the data collection in the dead of winter in Chicago, and we did it in person. So I'm just showing you this, just so you know that this, there was nothing convenient about this method. <laughs> and I can give you the names of my research assistants if you want that backed up who had to schlub down there every day in the winter. <laughs> anyway, there are all sorts of other uh, schools in between the two schools, but I still picked UIC. And the reason is that UIC actually ranks as one of the most ethnically diverse colleges in the country. And so that helps in diversity on the race, race ethnicity variable. Additionally, uh, UIC is not the flagship uh, campus of the UI system. So again, we have uh, more diversity. Index. Well, MIT is probably diverse in other ways, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, it's actually, so MIT has a lot of Asian Americans, presumably, uh, so that would give it a high diversity so index. Not, so this is racially, this, but not socio Yeah, this is specifically about racial diversity. Now, UIC is also diverse on other factors. Okay. Um, so another uh, thing that 
turned out to be very helpful uh, at UIC is that there's actually a course that every first year is required to take. So, and I worked with that course to, to uh, collect the data. We did uh, survey collection, data collection through a paper pencil method, um, which again is really not convenient because that has to be entered. So why not online? So why not online? Measure. <laughs> what? Right, so given that I'm interested in skill and what people do online and how much time they spend online, to, s to administer the study online would probably bias towards those who, who are more skilled or spend more time online, et cetera. So, Yeah, you know, sometimes people mention that, and that's actually still pretty much required in college these days to be able to take notes and stuff. And so people still know how, and they actually don't have to write, they just have to check things off. <laughs> so... I think people can still, re I think to get into UIC, <laughs> you still. He was, he was really serious. Okay, I don't have to address it? No, okay. Because I, <laughs> I can. <laughs> I've gotten that question before. Anything that Christian says? Okay. <laughs> okay, now before you think, oh, well, there was just this one course, that's really easy. I should mention that there are actually 92 different sections to that course that we had to go to. So. We were able to get into 86, and it was, again, in the winter that we did the data collection. Pretty campus, though. Um, very diverse population, though. Uh, our sample is uh, less than 50% white. We also have about half of the students whose uh, parents don't have a college degree. So that's where uh, parental education is the proxy for socioeconomic status uh, in the data set. Um, so that's helpful. On the other hand, we are controlling or nearly controlling for a couple of other factors, right? So there, we're controlling for education. Everybody is a first year in college. And we're also, also practically controlling for age. Um, but the reason that's actually an advantage here is that, as I mentioned earlier, those are the two main predictors of internet use in the first place. So the fact that we can control for those helps us see what else might matter. So if we, s if we still see variation, in both skill and internet use that suggests that if we had actually a more diverse sample, these findings would likely just be conservative to that, right? So remember that this is, while a diverse sample compared to national sample, is still a fairly specific population. So again, if anything, the findings are going to be conservative. Okay, so I thought I'd start with a few words about the fact that this is indeed the wired generation, which we hear a lot about. Um, so they, they grew up with technology. They all have either own or have easy access to a desktop or a laptop. Almost everybody has internet access at home. They certainly have it at school. Um, most have had it while in high school. They spend considerable time online. Also with respect to mobile, at least uh, cell phones, uh, they, they're quite connected. And again, so these data were connect collected uh, just over a year ago. Yeah, like they, me, they I don't wear my watch, watch either you know, anymore. That yeah, happens in the wire generation. Yeah, they don't do this. Right, so I don't have I don't have a watch anymore either. Right. It's what's what I use <laughs> for checking time, or I use my computer too. But um, yeah, so uh, on the other hand, they're not wired in every way. So for example, um, the majority of them have not accessed the web on their mobile phones now. Recall, this is a pretty diverse group, and in fact, having a uh, data plan on your phone is not that cheap. So that could very much be a reason. OK, so there's some sites that they use almost uh, universally, and then other sites that they don't. So what do you think are the sites among these that a year ago most of them would have said that they use? So the question basically, uh, the answer that I have is that they use it occasionally or often. YouTube is universal. OK. MySpace. MySpace. Flickr. Flickr. Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Anything else? Photo bucket? Is that it? World of Warcraft? Is OK. What? No, this, <laughs> this it's stumble upon. OK, so well, let's see what are the ones that are quite universal in this group. So these are the three that are close to universal. Um, and I will mention. It's Facebook, not MySpace, which is interesting given the other things that we've heard from Dana and you and others about. 
about the um, the divide. Right. Um, we tend to especially focus on the race ethnicity component, but um, yeah, I mean, I think data has pointed out that people as they get older tend to move away from MySpace into Facebook. Yeah, so these are all first year college students, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, I'll just briefly mention this, but I'm actually in the midst of uh, getting additional data on uh, these students. So we did a second wave of data collection this spring that these surveys are still, they're literally still coming in. So my RAs are entering those surveys right now uh, at Northwestern. Um, so we have a 40% response rate so far, which is not bad because we're doing it hard copy again. They have to send it back. Um, so, <laughs> right, well, so it's 20 bucks, which I, you'd think I'm, I'm giving everybody $20. Um, which is a lot for these populations. So in fact, from that perspective, you'd think more would fill it out, but we're, well, we're trying. Um, anyway, uh, there's some changes since last year, but not that much. So for example, Can we, oh, aren't you worried that um, in paying them $20, that uh, selects people who need the $20? Um, it might. So Obviously, the whole thing went through IRB. IRB usually tells you that if you're ask, paying too much, they didn't say I was paying too much. So, they, like, if you're, if I suggested, it might, it might, it could. And I'm, I'm checking to see. So I'm starting to perform diagnostics to see uh -huh. to what extent the, the second round people are representative of the first group, and um, they're. I don't know to what extent to get into this. So uh, fortunately, on the internet variables, they're actually representative, which is helpful because I'm most interested in that. They're not, so I've looked at about 380, which we've entered, and need another 50 or so entered right now. But um, the they do seem to be somewhat lower SES, which, well, actually, it's complicated. I think it's going both ways. So one is that, yes, people from lower SES will be more excited about the payment. On the other hand, people from, there was a little bit of a glitch that I'm trying to uh, fix now. So the, the way we sent the letter, uh, it said we're doing a study on college students' internet uses because that's what it was last year. But we've only gotten responses from four students who've dropped out of college. And I realized that, so I'm sure more have dropped out. And because, we've, w because I worded the letter saying it's college students, I may have, um, selected out those who've left college. So we're actually, uh, I'm going through IRB now to get permission to rewrite the letter so that I can send out a letter that says it's a study of young adults and you don't have to be in college anymore. Um, so I think I might bias in both directions. So I think lowest SES may have dropped out of college, may not be sending it back because they don't think they're of interest, mm -hmm. but then higher SES may not care that much about the money. So maybe that cancels things out, I'm not sure. It is interesting, though, that I do have 10% of people who've sent it back who've switched away from UIC mostly to community colleges. It's very interesting to have data on them. So um, anyway, so I don't really have much on these people because, again, the data are just coming in and I'm still cleaning the data set. But I can tell you that these numbers are pretty much constant. Wikipedia might have gone up a little bit. Facebook is at 88% for, for the 380 I've looked at. Okay, so. All the other sites, I will now reveal the numbers, um, but they're way lower. So this is in, in decreasing order of popularity, and you'll see that they're um, quite low. Uh, now, this is the one that has gone up quite a bit for this year's group. It's now at 18%, but still hardly what the popular press would make you believe in that everybody's using Twitter. Um, and again, these, this is 18 and 19 year olds, which you know, for LinkedIn, it makes sense that they're not using it. They're not on the mar job market yet. But uh, for other things, if anyone was going to use them, it's probably them. So, you know, if anyone was going to use the sites like World of Warcraft, you'd think it would be the 18, 19 year olds. And so I think it's an important reality check that if you take a, a pretty average population, um, this is what you get in terms of their internet uses. So why are we at exactly? I'm sorry? Why are we because they're in school. Uh, they're in school and they're looking <laughs> up a lot of things for school. We actually, 
I think it is. And uh, a student and I have a paper coming out uh, specifically looking at the interview observation material about how they approach Wikipedia and that their professors tell them they shouldn't use it, but of course they use it. But some, and some know how to use it and some don't, and there's definitely variation there. Um, and in the follow-up survey that, um, um, that I'm getting data on right now, I had some more detailed questions about Wikipedia to get a sense for how much they understand what Wikipedia is really about. And I think that'll be interesting because it'll show that quite a few of them don't actually realize that anyone can edit Wikipedia, and that's potentially problematic. Otherwise, obviously, Wikipedia can be a great source of information. Um, OK, so I just wanted to say that the data are more representative than they might first appear. Uh, here's an example. So in a journal issue that Dana co-edited with Nicole Ellison a few years ago, I had a paper. Um, and from based on the 2007 data set, which was very similar to this one, um, which got limited press coverage because, well, it was only college students. Um, however, interestingly, two years later, there was big national press about Nielsen finding very similar things about a nationally representative sample, but it was pretty much the same thing that I'd found two years earlier based on this sample. So I think that's a good indication that the sample is actually quite good in, uh, in um, uh, showing various trends that are actually more generalizable than they may appear. OK, so first I'm interested in whether there's a skill, skill gap. and um, I measure this in various ways, but the measure I use here that I've published about a couple of times now um, is basically an index uh, compiled of 27 items where I asked students to rate their level of understanding of various terms. And so there are what I call basic internet re uh, related terms and then more web 2.0 types of terms. And it's one to five point scale. And this is what we get for their level of understanding. And there's quite a bit of a range, which is helpful, of course. Um, and then for the more advanced internet-related terms, it's uh, quite a bit of a drop in general average understanding. And so here you could say things like, oh, well, maybe they don't understand what RSS is, but they use a feed reader. And actually, they don't, because I have a couple of other questions on the survey. And a bunch of them actually specifically say, no, I don't know what a feed reader is. And, um, so that's just another one of those things, right? Like every website now has an RSS and button. and so they're very flashy things, and everyone's trying to catch up. But in fact, a lot of people out there have absolutely no idea what those things are. And again, there's quite a bit of range. So then I'm interested in looking at how user background relates to skill, as measured by this 27 item index, which is uh, normally distributed. And what we have is men, on average, uh, report higher levels of skill. We also have a relationship between self report. Self -report. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this. I will come back to this. <laughs> Don't worry. I will <laughs> talk about the, it is true about everything, actually. I know. I know. Yes. It's, just the average it's the average of the 27 items for each person. <coughs> so on a one to five point scale, as you can see. Um, race ethnicity is also related to uh, self-reported skill. I, it is self-reported skill. I want to say that it is a better proxy than simply ask. So a lot of surveys simply ask people, what level of skill are you? And then there are five options, none or low, and then blah, 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 excellent. This is better than that. So this, this, this is not quite as gender biased, but there is a whole big gender story, which I'll be talking about briefly. Um, and then we definitely also have statistically significant um, difference by parental education, which is a proxy for socioeconomic Whites and blacks seems to be smaller than between males and females. Yes. But, OK. <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. OK. So <laughs> moving on, because these are all just bivariate, right? Um, which I actually, I don't have the regression results here, but I can, um, yeah, I could have. I have a lot of stuff to show you. But um, those actually, both gender and race ethnicity, I think, uh, remain significant even in regression. Um, OK, but what, uh, just sort of summing up this, the skill relationship. So if you take the average female of Hispanic origin whose parents have less than high school education in the sample, this is her skill score. And if you take the average Asian male whose parents have graduate degree, that's his skill score. It's quite a bit of a difference. 
So I did want to say a word about gender because it comes up. And it's not something I was really studying in earlier work, and then it kept coming up, so I started studying it more and more. Um, and so uh, here's a paper that I wrote based on a different, an earlier data set uh, where I had both the actual skill measures and the, the self-reported skill measures. Actually, that was the other self-reported. That was the very basic, simple self-report. But basically found that men and women were pretty much <coughs> very similar in their actual abilities, but they differed considerably in their self-reported skill. And the literature, we did, the literature review we did back then suggested that pretty much every realm that research has looked at this, this is consistent. It's, I mean, it's certainly true for math, but even beyond scholastic things. It's just, it's just the case. Now, I don't know of any studies where they... Well, okay. <laughs> so I don't know of any studies that asked about what would be a stereotypically female... Uh, for example, so I don't know any studies that have done that, and it would be interesting to see if in that case we find something different. I don't know. Um, but one of the things that we, we conclude with is that whether... Whether actual or perceived, it might affect what you end up doing. And I have more data on this, so let's move on to the next step. Um, OK, so I thought I'd show you this cartoon, too. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but um, I'm actually going to uh, say a few words about this, because I've presented this in front of uh, a few audiences before, and I think some people actually misunderstood. So <laughs> let me explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain it. What's going on here is that when it's a woman who makes a mistake, her entire gender is basically considered to be incapable at that activity. And if you go through education where you're constantly getting that negative feedback, that's going to have an effect on you potentially. Whereas the idea here is that it, the guy who gets it wrong, it's just him who happened to get it wrong. Can you explain to us how other people interpret it? Oh. I'll leave that for, a, some, for some other exercise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, but the idea is that a lot of this is about socialization and feedback people get. And, and um, you know, if you're the, anyway, I think hopefully you could take it to the next level, but we could talk about it offline later more. But the idea is that the level of socialization that works into how people perceive their skills um, OK, so then um, I'm interested in what people do online, right? Online behavior, which one way to look at it is in terms of quote unquote participation. And what that refers to is online activities where you're actually contributing content. And the idea is that this is a higher level activity because you're now um, influencing online conversations, potentially having an effect on public opinion, things like that. So this is uh, in some ways a more uh, kind of a higher order act online activity than simply looking at content, right? Because uh, you're actually contributing to the material that's out there for others to see and the conversations in which others can engage. So here are some questions that I asked on the survey about online engagement. And I actually have measures beyond just, so the answers were never once, two or three times, four or more times. But I basically here just broke it into just did ever. So. And the reason is that, in fact, not that many people engage in these, some of these activities. So um, it's not necessarily meaningful to try to break it down into more detail. So here's what we have. So basically, none of these activities have at least half of the students engaged, which is interesting because, again, you've got these 18, 19-year-olds who are super wired, and they're understood to be the super savvy. But as I'm showing you, they're not necessarily. Um, OK. so. Those of you who've seen this already shouldn't jump in just yet. But uh, those of you who haven't seen this, what do you think? So there's actually a method to the madness in which I organize this material here. Now, it's obviously not descending or ascending order of popularity, but there is some reason for giving you the list this way. I actually don't know if anyone in this room has seen this. So yes? You think this is the easiest? Um, no, no, in terms of the, like, the barrier to entry, right? Like, for creating a quiz, you know, you need to know stuff, what sites to go on and organize stuff. Wikipedia, you just click and start typing. OK. It might vanish after. That's like, interesting. But, and submitting review, the same thing. Whereas YouTube, like, top of videos, you need to come and all this stuff. Interesting. Let's keep that in mind as we find out what's going on. It's an interesting observation. Yes? 
This is also like self-assessment. So the top, it doesn't really matter um, what your personal perception of what your actual creating is. But the bottom, uh, you're kind of assuming that people are depending on what your actual <coughs> Okay, yeah, I can see that. It's sort of a, I can see how these are similar in that sense. You're more and more yeah. judging. Well, I'm sorry? You're more and more judging stuff. You From create. down to there? Yeah, you sort of... You because here you judge judgment. that it's incorrect, so you need to correct so it, is that kind of thing? So you sort of more thing? and more have to make judgments okay. all about what you... Yeah. I was going to say social and private. So it's sort of the top as I'm engaging with my friends, the bottom I'm doing something is sort of for everybody to see, but it's not particularly engaged with anybody in particular. Interesting. Okay, so... Oh, yes? Go ahead, go ahead. Well, it, it seems like there's more and more confidence that you need to have as you go from top to bottom, because the last one you need to be sure you're right. So the perception of your confidence is much higher than the first one, which we just a party in by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is great. Yeah, right. So this is excellent because the, the way I've organized it is by gender difference. And so this very much relates to what we were talking about before, right? So you have <laughs> the... <laughs> Uh, this very much relates to what we're discussing about self assessed abilities and self confidence and at some level potentially self esteem um, and that that's where we see the largest difference. I mean that's a huge difference. Huge. And in fact the data that I have coming back from the current survey where I have even more detail about this is even crazier. Like the gender difference because now I've this year I've asked about specifically asked about editing uh, adding a new entry at editing an entry, tweet. I, I have several things, and it's just, it's crazy how different some of them are. Also, like, the, the part about the product or service goes very much against the standard stereotype that, of women, that women are, are the ones who are buying stuff. Well, they might be buying, but they're but not the ones. Not, but yes, <laughs> right. they may be buying, but not feeling that they should. Not expressing their opinion that. about it. Yep. Yeah, which is just amazing. Yep. This yes. You saying thirty percent of like eighteen-year-old guys at some reasonable college, like, um, are changing Wikipedia. I mean, this is really troubling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what college you're at. Like, like first years in college, these these are the people writing on Wikipedia. This <laughs> well, it could be a little too. <laughs> <tough. laughs> I mean, that's, well, that's another takeaway. <laughs> Oh. Are people, are people surprised by this percentage? Actually, of most, most edits to Wikipedia are very simple corrections. Yeah, I think there are probably little, little tweaks. So it, it's, like a, it's like a spelling fix. It's very simple things. So actually, you don't know. She'll have more data on it this year, but like. I mean, this is like, I feel like most, most, most people in our area, like, we're pretty astounded that there are people who bother to write all this intricate math stuff and blah, 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 and think that, you know, it's. But I mean, this could be as simple, literally as simple as like correcting a typo or putting a D instead of an A, right? And yeah. Anyway, I mean, partly what was interesting about what you said was it's so simple, you just click the edit button. But in reality, a lot of people have no idea that that's what you do to edit an entry. Like they don't even realize you could do that. So that's why it's not that simple. Well, these are 18 year olds who. Yeah, I mean, they're using Wikipedia a lot. It's true. Yeah, 90% of them, right, were using Wikipedia. Yeah. So I mean, they're on the site all the time. The in fact, in the observational study of 100 students, we had several who, so we asked them a dozen tasks, like a dozen questions of, you know, go find info about X, Y, Z. And a bunch of them, for like half of them, they went to Wikipedia. So it's a huge resource for a lot of them. OK, so there was one thing that women did more. and. Uh, Dana and I are working on a paper where we'll be discussing uh, this paper, uh, this data point in more detail. Um, but uh, the one thing that women did more is change the privacy settings of their Facebook profiles. A year ago. A year ago. But we'll have updated data for the last two months. Okay, so then um, just on, on the whole, just summed up. So there are a quarter of the students, again, in this young wired group that haven't done any of these things so again kind of reality check are they really the super web savvy some are some are not and then in terms of just how many of them have done these things more than once extremely few right so again a lot of students aren't really contributing content so uh, again looking at user background and how that relates to uh, amount of how many of these things you're engaging in 
again, big gender difference. Well, self-reported that you did something, I don't know if, I mean, I don't really see a good reason to say you didn't do something. I can see that, I think there's mo more issues with the skill self-report. I think self-report of whether you ever did something, I don't think there's that much reason for that to be off. I mean, there's always some error in self-report, but. No, 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 the man might actually brag that they are web savvy and therefore they claim they their might. engagement, which they don't. They might. Um, again, we have difference by race, ethnicity, mm -hmm. and we have um, difference by parental education. Now, I should also add that parental education and race, ethnicity are very much related, for sure. So in a regression, I'm not, I don't quite remember, but I don't know if race, ethnicity continue to be significant there. But, um, but again, if you, if you take the average Hispanic female whose parents have less than a high school education in the sample, she will have done one of those five things. If you take the average white male in the sample whose parents have a graduate degree, he will have done three, which is a really big difference. So again, uh, just overall bringing together lots of different outcomes that I've looked at, because these are just, uh, uh, this is really just one. Um, so I've looked at different outcomes, like number of different types of content you access, uh, content creation sharing, and also specific types of topics. And basically, the results tend to be quite consistent. Men do it more. People from higher SES do it more. Um, and skill matters. Now, obviously, sk skill is going to be circular here, right? Like, the higher your skill, the more you do, the more you do, your, the higher your skill. So that's a complicated variable, but the point is that it's definitely related. Okay, so... Um, Getting back to the gender aspect for, for a moment, um, so this is a, a separate paper from 2007 data, but s the same, very similar sample, um, where we, we found, again, that men were more likely to share videos and music than women, but, and this is where, but this is the interesting thing. When we controlled for the self-reported skill measure, the gender effect went away. So this is in regression. And so, this suggests that, so basically, if you have a man and a woman who both think, th who think that they're equally skilled, then they're sharing equally. So again, whether perceived or actual, it does seem to matter. And so that's important. Um, so let me take it to a higher level now. So uh, let's get to the policy aspect. So very soon after President Obama was elected, um, in one of his uh, weekend talks, he talked about the importance of wiring the nation and higher broadband adoption. Um, then 10 days later, I had the opportunity to go talk to the presidential, members of the presidential transition team to talk to them about how, yes, we need more broadband, but it's not enough. So while getting the country wired is a necessary condition to getting more people truly online, um, I'm sorry, it's, a, it, it's not as sufficient. Uh, condition, right? So that skill matters a lot, and you can give people internet access, uh, and you can get them online, but that doesn't mean that they're all going to be able to use it and all benefit from its potential. And I was excited to see that in the stimulus package, um, where they allocated billions of dollars to broadband, they actually specifically mentioned education awareness training. Big question, what comes of that? Now, I'm glad that that part actually made it also into the national broadband plan. So they seem to be quite conscious of the importance of digital literacy skills, and I keep talking to, to people in DC about this. Of course, we have a lot of challenges in terms of how to actually achieve that. But just to drive the point home, so why is it helpful to focus on skill in all this? Well, other factors that matter are not really open to policy intervention or require way more serious policy in intervention in terms of, for example, lifting people to other socioeconomic levels. Um, However, skill is the kind of thing that you can intervene on. And so if skill is really the kind of thing, whether it's to get people to feel better about the skills they have or actually have better skills, the point is it is something where we could have intervention in a much more realistic manner and thus uh, could that way improve people so that the, from those graphs I showed, so instead of this, hopefully we get this. Um, so just to sum up, uh, Differences in skill and context of use, uh, not just basic access, matter to what people end up doing online. And uh, these may result in differential opportunities by type of uh, population segment. And so mentoring, education, support need to be part of 
getting people online. We can't just wire the country and think that that'll take care of everything. So I'll just thank my funders and my students and staff. And thank you. Wonderful. There was something I forgot to announce when I announced Esther, which is that she just won the Young Scholar Award of the International Communication Association, which is an award which is given for you know work done over the first seven years of your career or something. So and and uh, the reason I thought of it now is because I saw the talk and I went. Yeah, now I understand why. That's, this is awesome. Okay. Well, thank so you. Questions. <laughs> so, um, it seems like one takeaway from your work is that skill matters, um, and that that was something we can we can target. So do you, does your work have anything to say about where to target skill development within sort of differentiation by socioeconomic status? Or, in other words, I'm trying to think about interaction effects. I can imagine that you know that uh, if you're in a poor SES background, then you know the returns to higher skills are very sharp, or maybe they're mm. very flat, or right. Is there anything you can say about that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think certainly uh, lower SES. I mean, there's also the question of what age, right? Which is a kind of it's not really what you're asking, but I'm bringing it up because it's actually a really big part of it too. If it's younger, I mean, at some level, you want to target younger because that lasts through the life course, hopefully, and potentially potentially you think it might be f easier because these people are in an educational institution of course anyone who knows anything about education knows that those institutions are nearly impossible to change so to actually like try to change something about the curriculum isn't really going to happen so then you think well is it something um, so like in some ways almost least helpful would be to start something at the college level because those people are already privileged they're in college but I think in terms of what's realistic I think that would be f to start things off would be realistic to try to s try something at the college level and again there are a lot of college level students in the US who are still quite low SES in fact and is this the kind of thing that might help them stay in school who knows I mean they're one of the problems actually because it's something I'm trying to pitch on campus is t even though Northwestern's quite, quite elite we still have quite different large differences in skill one of the problems is that before people sign up for something like this, they want to know how you evaluate a program like this. And it's very hard to have measurable short-term outcomes of skill. I mean, I could, you know, maybe I can have a test at the end where they are better at the skill, but can I show output in their grades or got a job? It's really hard to do. And so just like assessment of lots of other things, it's very hard to know what are the right assessments to, to show that the, the training actually made a difference. But otherwise, I mean, generally speaking, I do think that lower SES is probably where you definitely want to do it. Now just one more, one more point on that. I mean, another, the, the way I fr framed this is mainly that the, the better you are, the more you do, the more you benefit. There's actually a whole other side to this, which is if you're really bad, if you really don't understand what's going on, you can get in a lot of trouble, right? So whether it's phishing attacks or, or various scams, that if you, don't, if you don't get the web, you could actually, it's not like what's the opposite of benefit in a talk appropriate way. I have lots of words for it, but like, uh, yeah, detrimental um, if you fall for those scams. So in fact, it could almost, so that idea of the slope going down is not completely crazy you could actually lose money by not knowing what you're doing. So, and if, if that's SES related too, then you'd want to target those groups. That's why? The detriments might be easier to measure than the benefits. I mean, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> did, I, did I lose a lot of money online, right? Uh, well, so it's actually more problematic than that because one, you have a challenge of getting self-reporting, right. right? A lot of times people do not self-report that they fail, they, they, they get caught in a scam. So you don't even have a good way of measuring it at the end. Two, it happens over a much longer period of time. Um, you know, and you, you know, there's attempts to measure this, but it's not actually as easy as you think. No, I'm not saying it's easier. I'm just trying to think about easier versus <laughs> getting a job or something. Right? That seems like it's really tough. You know, this like it's quite concrete limit. Right. You could imagine putting people at a terminal and having them go through some simulation where there might be a kind of malware. Actually, people are universally bad at it. Yeah, I mean, it's true that that is something that people are so bad at generally that... Yeah. Like 90 something percent bad. I mean, I do, like, on the survey that I just did, I had some phishing 
quite like uh, asking people to identify correct URLs, and it is unbelievable how poorly they did. It is really scary. And these are people, and, and that's assuming people even look at the URL, which a lot of people don't. But anyway, but yeah, I, I think identifying that they don't know it was one thing, whether they had some outcome of that, or whether they even realized that it was a phishing attack, or that, right? Because that's the other yeah, part. Do you know that why you landed in that situation? I know there was some, yes? So this is going to be a little confounded with SES, but I was wondering if you were able to look at whether or not um, the respondents were, say, first generation immigrants, right? Because you can imagine some sort of cultural issues in terms of sort of gender differences, and I was wondering if you were able to. Mm. Maybe can you say more about the gender difference well, with I mean, the I immigration? Say, like, say in um, maybe a more traditional household where maybe the females aren't encouraged to do certain things, or they're encouraged yeah. to do things that may not necessarily be related to sort of, you know, web skill types of activities. And I was wondering if there was a way to maybe get Right. That. So I definitely, so the, the question about immigrant status is a very good one, especially with this population. So about half, no, that's not right. But um, so a, a pretty large chunk of the students in the sample are actually from immigrant families. So they're, they might not be first, but they're often second generation. 49% of them had at least one parent who was an immigrant. That was okay. one of the things that you Okay, great. Um, so, so yeah, so a lot of them are from immigrant families. Uh, I haven't run the data that way. I do know that gender, like no matter what you control for, gender is always an important factor. Now, whether some of that goes away with immigrant status, that would be interesting to look at. I also know that some of it, uh, so a lot of the Hispanic students are the ones who, well, it's, so race, ethnicity, and immigration here are pretty confounded because huge Asian population, as you saw, a pretty big Hispanic population, and those tend to be the immigrants. Although there's certainly also whites because there are a lot of Poles, for example, in the area. But um, it's, I'll have to check for that. I haven't looked at that. That's an interesting really question. Good. I mean, I just got anecdotal evidence <laughs> about this um, from thousands of students I taught, though, and I talked to over the years. Um, one thing that I saw that amazed me was I saw a lot of women who were first generation Asians who were talented in mathematics, quite talented, and when I talked to them about whether they would go on, they would tell me that their parents had discouraged them, whereas they had encouraged their brothers. So I wonder if you might see an even larger split in the Asians if you, if you did that. I see. And even now, talking to grad students at MIT, I hear some of the same things. Oh, if you keep on doing this, you're never going to get married and have children. Yeah. You know, which is yeah. kind of weird. So. Yeah, no. I mean, I could even just split the sample, actually, yeah. and run it separately. Yeah, maybe the opposite effects are too, right? Because there's some big argumentation that if you are a first generation immigrant from Mexico, you sort of shouldn't be considered uh, sort of disadvantaged minority if you grew up in the slums of LA you're much more minority seriously there's sort of this discussion oh well what's Hispanic what counts as Hispanic as a whole other thing right I mean that's right, right. yeah I don't I mean I guess so I'm not sure what you're asking or Hispanic who has lived sort of with second generation in the US may actually be in a much worse social economic status oh, I see what you're saying. than somebody who just came in mm from like a, a rich Mexican. So I actually do also have data on um, where they were born and wh what, what, how old they were when they moved here. Um, I mean, the numbers start getting pretty small when you start breaking it down that much. I would say the majority of the immigrants are second generation, not first. Mm -hmm. But it's, I, I could try to look at it. I don't know if I have the numbers quite, but I could try. I mean, certainly I have more <laughs> minority in this sample than most samples we see. I mean, it's really the, the racial ethnic uh, variation is quite large. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about kind of the future of this research project uh, because obviously you have data coming in right now, but you know the next generation or cohort of students that come in, they're going to have you know possibly wildly different. Uh, range of skills, you know, either maybe they're all lifted or you see participation going up in one group. And I'm also curious about a mobile computing component as that becomes more and more um, a factor in these things. And I would like you to talk a little bit about methodology and thoughts going forward in, in researching this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sure. So in terms of new generations bi being wildly different, it's actually not quite the case. So I referenced a couple of those two papers I cited 
were both based on 2007 data, but the findings actually completely hold for this group. So in 2007, I did the same study with the first years from that year. And um, all the trends pretty much hold. Uh, the numbers do change a little bit, usually at the 100th <laughs> decimal more than. So it's not like the skill is going up phenomenally. Um, there are a few things where it goes up quite a bit. So like tagging is understood much better. I think that's something like Facebook where you tag that has popularized it enough. But most of the terms are understood at pretty similar levels. That said, even if it were to go up, I think part of the issue is that new things come, right? The web is continually developing itself. So while you might, while people might catch up with some of the things that were advanced three years ago now become almost basic, we'll have the new set of things that are advanced that only the really savvy know. And so I suspect we continue to see differences. It's just that the instrument needs to be updated. So that's the issue about uh, what we'd see over time. Um, and also with respect to, so for example, that work about Facebook, MySpace, racial ethnic differences, and who uses which, my, my, uh, my findings are completely robust from 07 to 09. Now, obviously, if a site completely saturates, you won't have those kinds of findings. But Facebook, even with this second, the, the sophomores hasn't saturated. It's at 88% over 87. So it actually hasn't changed that much. Um, OK, so then you asked, all oh, right, mobile devices. Well, so I've, I'm, I've collected quite detailed data both last year and this year about what services they use on mobile devices and whether they use access the web, things like that. Um, one of the things I've found that's consistent with some other people in this realm is that, very interestingly, African Americans tend to use those things more than anybody else. Um, and I don't think we really know what's going on there. Um, I think we need more work on that. Uh, that said, I think it would be hard to argue that it's the same experience to do a lot of these things on a screen this big versus the you know, laptop or desktop. So I don't know how far you can take this idea that mobile is completely democratizing participation and being engaged. So I don't know. Now maybe with things like the iPad, but I mean, I sort of doubt the iPad's going to be universally diffused across all these populations. But yeah, exactly. So I don't, I don't think we're quite there for that. Methodologically, I mean, are you asking, wh what are you asking? Like sampling or mode of? ways you would approach those particular issues in future studies? I mean, so this is, this is something that's been ongoing for me and things I've had to move away from. So one thing that I've recognized is I'm less interested in what specific device you're using for something I'm more interested in whether you're doing something, right? Now, I haven't quite merged my questions in a way that it's agnostic to online versus saying include your mobile device per se, but um, so that's one way to think about it. Of course, again, if you want to compare across over time for the same group, you can't really change the questions um, or you're losing comparability over time. Um, but I tr again, I try to focus on the things people are doing less and less on the devices per se. Yes? So there was one question before about outcomes, and you made a strong argument and a persuasive one that it's very hard to link the sort of web use to a particular outcome. But I feel like there's, there's also an input question, which is given, you know, if you were the school and you're thinking about where to spend a dollar to help kids do better at school or to have better life outcomes, would you spend a dollar on, you know, reading? Would you spend a dollar on math? Or would you spend a dollar on web skills? And that's, and, and so I wonder how you think about where, how important are these skills relative to a whole host of other things we could as, as some kind of intervening body spend mm -hmm. a dollar on. Right, so I think it's a very legitimate question. And so one way to think about it is how might being more literate online help develop reading skills better, help develop math skills better, et cetera, right? So that if, if these skills could actually be a means to getting better skilled at those things, then you could argue that, well, why not spend here? Because that will actually then have outcomes there as well. I, I don't know, I don't, it's not something, it's certainly not something I've been able to study. I think it's a very legitimate question, but I don't think the answer is simply, oh yeah, you first need to teach them how to read. Because I think there could be, these could be related. You had a question. Well, 
it kind of extends, I think, what you were asking. And uh, it happens to do with the notion of, with, with abstraction. So there are many activities you had listed. I mean, Facebook is you know, one kind of activity. Then you have the search activity. And so uh, technologies come, technologies go. I mean, companies come, companies go. There's a new, next newest craze that comes on. And so would it not make uh, sense maybe moving forward to find uh, abstraction in terms of actions that you would map to? So would you say, are people doing this search for their yep. school work? Are they doing um, Facebook? Facebook, you can do many things. You can search on yep. Facebook, but you would also use it to communicate. And so you upload a YouTube video, you want to broadcast. Sometimes you just want to ping somewhere else. Right, so actually most of my survey does exactly what you're saying. I, I started, I wasn't even really going to do the whole Facebook MySpace thing that I keep referring to, but it became such a big issue a couple of years ago that I dove into that part of the data set. But in fact, just like as I'm agnostic to devices, I'm really agnostic to sites. So almost all of my questions are just generally about things you might do. So like when I refer to... Um, the outcomes as more diverse types of uses. That's basically there. I count up. I asked about like 20 different types of information you might seek online. And I don't care where you seek it. I was just interested. Do you look at sports? Do you get news? Do you look at political? Do you look at entertainment? Do you get all sorts? I really don't care where you do it. And so almost all of my questions are that type. Now, one of the things that is methodologically tricky and this is what I meant when I, I referred to in the beginning the challenge of, of established terms, is that researchers might think of social network site, but a user might not, especially an 18-year-old. Now, survey research would generally tell you it's not a good idea to give specific examples, because if you're giving specific examples, then you're already prompting them about that one specific example and might lose them if that doesn't apply to them. So like, you wouldn't want to say, do you use social network sites? such as Facebook or MySpace. You don't want to say that. On the other hand, in this case, if you don't say it, so I pre we always pretest these instruments. When I pretested the instruments three years ago, and I said that, and I did not say Facebook, people said no. And I said, what are you guys kidding me? And I mean, I did this with my students, and then I talked to them about it. I was like, oh, is that what you meant? So I, I mean, it's a huge challenge of these instruments. So that's why sometimes you actually have to get specific, but whenever possible, I try not to for sites. Yes, Mary. Just, just to add on, you were talking about different types of views. So what do people seek uh, and look for on the internet? Uh, what sort of information? I think uh, when I got your uh, right, uh, if I got you right, you you could like uh, in the long run um, uh, enlarge your research by looking at, at, at different types of content people produce uh, using content analysis. I mean, if you're like uh, using Twitter and you, you um, you, you write your tweet saying sitting at High Rise Cafe sipping a coffee, or you write like why does BP fuck, uh, screw up this this whole oil uh, spill in in the Gulf of Mexico? There's quite a difference in doing that. So one is related to a status update, the other one is related to to political information, to political judgment. Uh, same is true to to um, um, writing a Wikipedia entry or or changing Wikipedia. Uh, with um, uh, uh, correcting something or really uh, changing some some information related to political judgment. Mm -hmm. So uh, that I would find very, very, very interesting. Yeah, I think I completely agree. It would be great. I mean, I can see basically if one were to do a study on like pick one of those and just focus an entire survey on that. Unfortunately, if I'm going to have all the different things, I can't dig quite that deep into any of those. But you're absolutely right that just asking people, do you post a video? I mean, that, that tells us very limited information. I completely agree. Like, it could be a video of your cat, or it could be a video at a demonstration that you attended, and those have very different implications. Um, I think at some level, we can argue just posting a video still means something. It means that you've taken that one step. But yes, it would be, it would be wonderful to have more detailed data. I'm trying to think. I don't really have much more detail. I've, I've, broke, I've started breaking down a few things in the survey. Like, I used to ask about just photography, and I ask about artistic versus just your everyday life. Um, I used to ask about just writing, now I ask about fiction versus not, but it's, it's pretty tricky because you could go so far. And I've, I've started doing a few more things. I keep adding things as people suggest things. Um, like one of the things that I don't have on that participation where the gender difference was so di big uh, 
was fan fiction. And so one of the critiques I got was, oh, well, the only reason you don't have women doing more is because you don't have fan fiction on there. OK, well, you know what? I put it on there. I've looked at the 380 cases I have, and men report doing it more than women, even that. So <laughs> there you go. Um, so I don't know. But I mean, that's sort of not exactly your point. I completely agree. It would be awesome if we could get more details about what content exactly people and are putting out nice there. Thing about what you said is that one thing that I wonder is, in terms, um, in terms of developing skills, I wonder if wanting to do something causes you to develop a skill mm. or having a skill allows you to do something. So if you really have a deeply held political view, do you make yourself more skillful so that you can, uh, you know, into the, uh, right? And, and even if you had that data, you still would have to be very careful about surmising causal things. But I think those are some of the most interesting conclusions one could No, draw. absolutely. And I do actually, I've started collecting data about level of interest in certain topics. Now, not super specific, but I have like interest in politics, interest in finance, interest in sports. And so I could actually now control for that. But again, unfortunately, my content creation activities are not quite that specific. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where I would be controlling for it. But I could control for it at least in like info seeking aspects, but unfortunately not so much in the posting. I, yeah, I don't think I have any area where I really get into content for creation, unfortunately. I think you would have to pick like, like one You'd have to like pick one area and focus a whole survey on it. Data just explode and yep. you can't handle that. Okay, well, thank you very much.